In this video, we'll discuss numerical errors. This is actually a really important topic in this class. We're using numerical methods to solve engineering problems, which basically means we're using some method to approximate a solution. And when you approximate, you obviously introduce errors. It's important to not only know the types of errors you can have in your system, but also to know the errors associated with a numerical technique. Here's the agenda for today. We'll start by defining some important terms. Then we'll cover round-off errors, which occur because of computer limitations. Digital computers generally don't give us the exact answer because of the limitations on representing numbers. Computers have a fixed number of bits used to represent floating-point numbers. We have to make choices on how big of a number can we use, and how close together can all the numbers be that we represent. That's round-off error. In the next video, we'll discuss truncation errors and total errors. Let's get started with a case study to emphasize why understanding errors is important. In 1982, the now defunct Vancouver Stock Exchange initialized their index at 1000. The index is a number that helps investors compare current stock prices with past stock prices. It's proportional to the selling price of each stock, so economists use the index to assess market performance. If the index drops, that generally means stock prices have dropped and the market isn't doing too hot. On the other hand, if the index jumps up, then the stock prices have also jumped up, which means business is probably pretty good. In 1982, the Vancouver Stock Exchange housed about 1,400 individual stocks. Every time a stock price changed, which happened about 2,800 times on an average day, a computer recalculated the index to four decimal places, but only reported it to three. So what happened to that last decimal place? It turns out that the computer truncated, or cut off, the last decimal instead of rounding it. For example, if the index stood at 540.3256, the computer simply dropped the last digit, making it 540.325. What the computer should have done is round the last digit to make the index 540.326. Other exchanges like the S&P 500, which you've probably heard of, routinely round instead of truncate, but the folks at the Vancouver Exchange weren't aware of that. So basically, there is an error in computing the third decimal place of a number, which seems pretty insignificant. But since the index was recalculated almost 3,000 times per day, the error propagated extremely fast. The index ended up dropping by about 1 point a day, which built up to about 20 points in a 1 month span. And over 12 months, the index dropped to 725 when it should have been around 960. This was incredibly confusing for economists because they were actually setting records in the stock market. It also didn't line up with the rest of the world. Some other exchanges experienced positive changes in their index, so the folks in Vancouver knew something was awry. They contracted an independent firm to investigate, and that's when they uncovered the error. 22 months after the index was initialized, they manually corrected their index from about 525 to about 1100. As you can expect, this really confused everyone since the stock prices were the same, so people didn't really know why the index more than doubled. Long story short, this left a huge dent in their reputation and they eventually merged into the current day Canadian Stock Exchange. This is a great example of how an error so seemingly small, only four decimal places, can potentially cause billions of dollars in damage if left unchecked. Here are some more interesting case studies arising from numerical errors. I won't go over them. You can look them up at your own leisure, but I hope these illustrate the significance of understanding errors. Accuracy and precision are two terms that many people use interchangeably. This is actually incorrect, there is a difference. Accuracy tells us how close we are to getting the right answer. Precision tells us within what range we can tell one number from another. Pretend you're throwing darts and you end up with these four scorecards. We can characterize each scorecard according to its accuracy and precision. If we look at A, all the darts are decently close to the bullseye, but they're spread out. We say that A is accurate but imprecise. On the other hand, all the shots in B are almost directly on top of the bullseye, and there's very little spread in the throws. We say that B is accurate and precise. Going down to C, you're never hitting the center and your throws are wildly scattered. That's inaccurate and imprecise. And for D, you're never hitting the bullseye, but at least you're consistent, so we say you're inaccurate but precise. Let's learn how to quantify error. We're interested in defining this now because these quantifications of the error are going to be the criteria we use to decide when we need to stop our algorithms. We're going to write iterative methods or some other method that approximates the solution 
and we want to know if our answer is good enough or not. And we need to understand why there are errors because we're generally not getting exact answers. We're looking for numerical solutions when we can't get exact answers, or if we have an exact answer, we're using it to verify our algorithms so we can check our numerical approximation. When we approximate or measure something, we can compare that approximation to the real value. We can define the absolute error as uppercase e sub t equals the true value minus the approximate value. Please note the absolute values. We don't care if the approximation is greater than or less than the true value. We really only care about the magnitude of the error. e sub t has units. If we're measuring something in feet, the error will also be in feet. But there's one shortcoming with this definition. It doesn't account for the order of magnitude. For example, an error of one minute is much more significant if we're counting the hours versus if we're counting the days. To rectify this problem, we can define the true relative error or percent error as lowercase e sub t equals 100% times the absolute value of the true value minus the approximate value all over the true value. By normalizing the error with respect to the true value, we eliminate the units and we can see how large the error is relative to the actual value. We frequently use this metric, so please commit it to memory. Let's do an example to illustrate these two errors. Say you walk 100 feet on a measured track, but your GPS claims that you only walked 99 feet. The next day, you walk 10 feet, but your GPS says 9 feet. For the 100 foot case, the absolute error is 100 minus 99 equals 1 foot. For the 10 foot case, it's 10 minus 9 equals 1. Both cases have the same absolute error. If we compute the true relative error, we get 100% times 1 over 100 equals 1% for the 100 foot case, and 100% times 1 over 10 equals 10% for the 10 foot case. Here we can see that even though both cases had the same absolute error of one foot, the 10 foot case had a significantly larger relative error. We can conclude that the GPS did a much better job at measuring the 100 feet than the 10 feet. The fundamental flaw in these errors is that they require knowing the true value. But you won't know the true value a lot of the time. After all, that's what the whole purpose of numerical methods is. We're trying to estimate the true value. If we don't know the true value, how are we supposed to know when to stop our algorithm? Well, we can introduce another metric called the percent relative error, which is defined as e sub a equals 100% times the present approximation minus the previous approximation, all divided by the present approximation. Note that we don't have any mention of the true value in this equation. The present approximation is made on the basis of the previous approximation, and we're seeing how the present approximation compares to the previous. If e sub a decreases, we're getting better. So how do we know when to stop iterating? We need to specify some threshold, otherwise EA will just keep getting infinitely smaller. We use a pre-specified tolerance or a stopping criterion called E sub S. You should design your algorithms to keep iterating and improving the approximation until the absolute value of EA falls under ES. So now the question becomes, how do we choose ES? Let's say you collected some data to two decimal places and then did some MATLAB calculations. And let's say MATLAB spits out the results of those calculations to six decimal places. If the data you got was a material property you could only measure to two digits, then four of those digits that you wrote down don't mean anything. So this formula provides a way to relate the number of significant digits of accuracy to the percent relative error. If you want n digits of accuracy, you can calculate the percent relative error and then check your stopping criterion to that percent. For example, let's say we wanted four digits of accuracy. We need 0.5 times 10 to the 2 minus 4, or 0.5 times 10 to the negative 2 percent, which comes out to 0.005%. It doesn't matter if we put 0.005 or 0.00005 in the computer. We're comparing ES to EA, and EA is also a percent, so the percents will just cancel. Okay, now let's move on to round-off errors. Round-off errors occur because computers only have so much precision. For some numbers, we can only get within so close to the actual number we want to represent. Take one-third. If I write it with decimals, one-third equals 0.333. How many threes do I need? I obviously can't store an infinite number on the computer. That's the only exact answer, but I have to stop somewhere depending on the number of bits I have. So there's some precision associated with representing the number digitally. And if we start operating on erroneous numbers, the errors can propagate. 
Going back to the Vancouver Stock Exchange example, the error was in the fourth decimal place. That's not much at all, but letting that error sit unchecked for 22 months made it accumulate. Computers represent numbers in binary. In fact, the word bit is a portmanteau of binary and digit. The number system we use in our daily life is called base 10. Base 10 uses the digits 0 through 9 to represent numbers. For large numbers, we use positional notation to create groups of large numbers, which we sum to form a singular number. For example, take the number 523. The subscript 10 indicates base 10 notation. In this row, I have 1, 10, and 100, representing the 1s, 10s, and 100s place, respectively. If we think about this in exponential notation, 1 is really 10 to the 0, 10 is really 10 to the 1, and 100 is 10 squared. Therefore, we can write 523 as 3 groups of 1, plus 2 groups of 10, plus 5 groups of 100, and altogether, we'll get 523. Binary follows the exact same format, but instead of 10 to the 0, 10 to the 1, and 10 to the 2, and so forth, we replace the 10 with a 2. So this is 2 to the 0, which is 1, this is 2 to the 1, which is 2, this is 2 squared, 2 cubed, and 2 to the 4th. Let's say we have one group of 2, one group of 2 squared, and one group of 2 to the 4th. If we sum those numbers, then we get this binary number 10110 in base 2, which translates to 22 in base 10. We can see this because 16 plus 4 plus 2 equals 22. I won't go too in-depth on the binary. You don't need to know how to convert to or from binary. That's not really important in this class. What you do need to know is that MATLAB represents numbers using 64 bits. Numbers are formatted and expressed according to this equation. We call f the mantissa. It's a fraction between 0 and 1. 52 of the 64 bits MATLAB uses are devoted to the mantissa. e is called the signed exponent and ranges from negative 1022 all the way to positive 1023. Of the 64 bits, e occupies 11. What we mean by signed is that the leftmost bit is purely devoted to declaring the sign of a number. We use 0 to indicate a positive number and 1 to indicate a negative number. If we go back to the example on the previous slide, we already know that this binary number occupies the five rightmost slots. The leftmost bit will be zero, since the number is positive, and so we fill the remaining five bits with zeros. Here's a quick summary of the largest and smallest representable numbers in MATLAB. This is the largest real number in binary, and MATLAB stores this in base 10 in a variable called real max. Likewise, MATLAB stores the smallest real representative number in a variable called real min. Real max and real min can be negative as well. This actually creates a pretty interesting problem. What happens if you want to compute a number that's larger than real max? If you attempt this, MATLAB will overflow and will automatically convert that number to infinity. The same thing happens if you try to make a negative number larger than negative real max. If you try to use a number smaller than real min, MATLAB won't be able to tell the difference between that number and zero. This is called underflow, and MATLAB will automatically assign that number to zero. All of this leads us to conclude that f limits our precision. The mantissa occupies 52 of the 64 bits, which means we can represent numbers up to about 15 or 16 decimal places. On the other hand, e limits our range. e occupies 11 bits, so we can represent numbers from 10 to the negative 22 power all the way up to 10 to the positive 1023 power. These are how real min and real max are determined. I'd like to show you a GUI I found online illustrating some subtle effects of floating point representation. This GUI was written by Cleve Muller, one of MATLAB's founding fathers. You can find the link to the GUI in the video description. You can use these sliders to play around with the range of the exponent and the number of bits in the mantissa. Let's just look at the default values of e min equals negative 1, t equals 1, and e max equals 1. Because of our extremely limited precision and range, we can only represent 6 numbers. Notice how the interval between numbers increases as we move between orders of magnitude. For the numbers here, the spacing is 0.25. Once we cross over past 1, the spacing increases to 0.5. And once we cross over to 2, the spacing increases to 1. 
This means a number's round-off error is proportional to its magnitude. In addition, it means that the relative error will always have an upper bound. For this example, the maximum relative error would be 0.5. This value is commonly called EPS, or the machine epsilon. If we increase the mantissa by one digit, we only increase our range a little bit. But if we increase E min or E max, our range jumps. This implies that the exponent overwhelmingly determines these range limitations. Play around with this GUI to better understand how numbers are stored in different floating point representations. Let's explore some round off errors while we're in MATLAB. Here's real min and real max. MATLAB represents its machine epsilon in a variable called EPS. So we can see that MATLAB won't be able to distinguish numbers beyond the 15th or 16th decimal place. Let's say we want to define a variable called x as 10 to the negative 20. That's a really small number. Mathematically, if I add 1 to x and then subtract 1, I ought to get back x. But I get 0 because MATLAB can't tell the difference between 0 and 10 to the negative 20, even though I'm able to store 10 to the negative 20 in the computer without any problems. This is the result of round off error. Finally, here are some reasons why you might get a round off error. You tend to get it when you operate on small and large numbers together. This isn't an exhaustive list. You don't have to memorize any of these, but keep these in mind as you progress throughout the course. In the next video, we'll discuss truncation errors and the total numerical error.